This video is mostly for artists. Look, we need to talk. You have reaped the benefits of cheap global wages. You've reaped the benefits of manufacturing in other countries. You've gotten complacent. You've consumed too much. You've gotten fat and you think that you don't need to work a real job. You can just be an indie developer and make another indie game. Do we really need you making another indie game? No. Instead of going out and getting a real job like filling potholes, something we need, you are sitting at home making more indie games. Before we get started, let's head over to WhoKeys and unlock our copy of Windows. By using coupon code TS25, you can get 25% off these prices here. I use Windows 10 Pro. You can also get Windows 10 Home, and both of these will upgrade to Windows 11. You can get that. Also, note that the Windows 10 keys have been working with Windows 11. Google it and make sure that this is still a thing whenever you're purchasing your key. Also, I want to note that if you get Windows 10 Home and you upgrade it to Windows 11, they will force you to use an online account. With Windows 11 Pro, however, you can use a local account, just so you know. You can also get Office 2019 with that same discount. Or if you like, you can get Windows 10 Pro and Office 2019 in a bundle and save even more. So go ahead and put TS25 in here as your coupon code, hit it apply, and then you can see we can get Windows 10 Pro for $14.85. Once you're finished, if you want to access your key, you click on your name on the top right, click on User Center, and you'll see My Purchase Orders. Right here, you'll be able to view the keys that you've purchased just by clicking on View Keys and Codes. Then you will see your code right here. Just go ahead and copy this code, press Start, type Activate, and you'll see activation settings come up. Click on that, then click change product key. Right there, you can paste in your code and hit next, and then you will be activated. It's very simple. So don't pay those retail prices for your copy of Windows or Office. Head over to whokeys.com and use coupon code TS25. Of course, that intro is parody. This is a discussion about the value of art and culture in our society and the, the people that are making it. This is Spiderweb Software. This is the company that Jeff runs uh, with a few others, Jeff Vogel. And uh, they developed some very old school, right here's a, a talk from GDC I highly recommend. They developed some very old school, look at these games. This is uh, from way back then, but they haven't changed that much from 1995. Old school RPGs, they're fun, they're interesting. They have good plots. They, he reuses a lot of assets from game to game and for that style of game, it doesn't matter. It's just about the stories and the experiences and the combat mechanics and stuff like that. And I really appreciate Gene Forge. Let me see if he gets to that in here. Uh, skip forward a little bit. Because it's a, a bit of a different take on the standard fantasy uh, in Gene Forge, you get to create life. and They're all like these little dinosaur creatures. So it's kind of an interesting take on, it's not really necromancy because it's, I don't know. You, you've got to check it out on your own. But this is the, the person who wrote this article here. And essentially, I, you know, I was trying to go through this article and take it apart piece by piece because there are so many things in here that are, in my opinion, very cringeworthy. And despite the fact that I would buy Jeff a beer anytime and sit down and, and talk to him, uh, mostly about, you know, maybe the good old days of playing D&D &D and all that kind of stuff. But I don't think I can agree with almost anything in here. Uh, it seems to look at society and say, Okay, things are going in a wrong direction. That's like, you know, we started with this position. We started with the verdict. And the verdict is that society is going in the wrong direction. We are, we are, things are breaking. Uh, you know, like there's, there's, he mentioned several times because he lives in Seattle, there's potholes everywhere. The streets are not getting repaired. Essential jobs are not getting done. So, you know, we can look at the, you know, system, capitalism, but we don't want to blame that because, you know, it's capitalism. It's the best thing, you know, the great old American capitalism. We also don't want to talk about inequality. We don't want to talk about living wages and stuff like that. You know, where like if you paid someone enough to fill potholes, I'm sure someone would go fill the potholes. So I'm not even going to go through all of the points in here. I do recommend that you read this just for um, an idea of this stance. But what I want to do with this video is talk about how many games are being made, talk about the art that's being created, and I want to encourage you to keep making art, to keep making games, and to not let these numbers discourage you. Rather, I think this is good news. Do you hear me? It is good news 
that 11,773 games came out on Steam. That's not counting the gazillion games that were released on itch.io. That's not because counting all the games that people made and didn't get released. People are, are working on things and toiling on things, right? I'm going to read his thesis here, and then we're going to talk about why this is actually a good thing. So let's get to it. There are too many indie games. If my country was healthy, stable, and on a sustainable past, most of them would not exist, including mine. He always has to throw his in there because he doesn't want to be the bad guy, even though he's going to continue to make games. So, yes. <laughs> That they do exist is a symptom of misplaced priorities, crappy opportunities for ambitious youth, and ongoing damage to our society. So if you think that you can just be an artist and create stuff, well, you're wrong. You need to get a real job. That's sort of the side that he's on here, it seems to me. So let me get something straight. You think the, that the amount of people it takes to make 11,000 games and the fact that they're spending their time making those games, you think that's why the country's falling apart? Falling apart is always like some big sensational thing. Of course things are not good. Let's just say that on average, a lot of them are made by one person, but let's say on average two are working on these games. I'll do three. So three, and we'll do 12,000 just to round up for 2022. 36,000 people making games. Just to make sure we're doing it right, went to this website that calculates it for us. Um, 36,000 people is 0.01125% of the population. So you think that because 0.01125% of the population is doing an activity that you see as frivolous and, and irresponsible, you think that that's why things are, are not working correctly. You think that that's why we don't have good infrastructure and stuff like that. I cannot help you. Now what's even more ridiculous is the idea that most of the people making these games do not have day jobs. You have to provide for yourself. You have to eat. You have to have shelter. A lot of them probably live with roommates and stuff like that. But I guarantee you that most of the people making those 11,000 games have day jobs and they do contribute to society and they are not, you know, just living off of the, the fat of the land. I don't know, living off the, they're not just privileged people. You know, there might be a few, there might be some people living off of their parents or something like that, but I, I would wager that it is not the majority. But, but even then, policing what people do with their time, a lot of people make these games after work. They come home and they, they work on these games after they're done with all their other stuff. It's their way to unwind, so how dare you police that, number one. And number two, why not police other things? If you, if you want to single out that as an irresponsible or frivolous activity, let's just go a little bit farther here. And I'm going to say that the people who watch Fox News, that's a dumb use of their time. If they don't want to do something better with their time, they should use that time that they're rotting their brains out watching dumbass stuff on television they can go out and fill these potholes for you and make the streets better there i've i've done the same thing but actually with a stupid activity the other side of that is why don't we look at this from the standpoint of wow we have a society that is able to create a lot of culture we have people that feel free enough to create this culture. That should be a good thing. To me, the more art that's being created and the more people who are working on art and creating things, the better it is. And right now we kind of have a weird thing where society is having issues and people are still just stepping back from those issues and saying like, you know what, we're stressed enough. The rich have been forcing us to do all of their chores for them and make all the money for them and do way too much work. You know, we have to work two to three jobs in most places just to have a, a place we can live in and food to eat. So people are not getting paid enough and a lot of them are just being like, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna make art. And then on the other side, the people who are a little more fortunate and have money are also feeling like they are able to make art. So we have tons and tons of art. We are creating culture and that is my opinion what society is about the shared experiences that we all have that become culture and we have so many people creating it. So I don't understand how that's a bad thing. How is it a bad thing that we have this much to choose from? Maybe it's a little difficult to find stuff, but not even, I mean, not even that difficult. So there's a website here called What's on Steam and every day it shows you the new stuff that's on Steam. And there are about 20, 30 things that are released every single day. You can scroll through here and look. You know, sometimes this, some of this new stuff is having pretty good graphics and stuff. But you can scroll through and see that, you know, 
a lot of this stuff is pretty niche. You know, another zombie game, another this, like, what, what is this? This looks very simplistic. Maybe it's very interesting. Who knows? An open world 2D platformer. I'm sure we've seen all these before. Some of these are going to be derivative. Everything's derivative a little bit. But, you know, scroll through and you can see all the stuff that's going to be on Steam every single day. Maybe something on here is exactly the game for you. Maybe you've always wanted a game where you can just shake a salt shaker on top of a slug and maybe that's been released today and here it is for $1.99. You know, we've got, we've got the, these things. Um, so this is what's been released every day. Does any of this interest you? Uh, to be honest, nothing really on here like looks like something I would play. An auto battler, no. You know what I mean? But you, you can see that the, a lot of these games are like probably not going to be rated like overwhelmingly positive or anything like that. Maybe a couple of them are. I don't know. I haven't tried them all. But the point is, is that a lot of these games are learning experiences for the developers. Not every single game that comes out is good. In fact, most of, most of the games that come out are probably not very good. So a lot of this stuff is just thrown on Steam. Maybe someone wants to buy it or not. Uh, who knows? Um, I don't know how you know how much people anticipate to sell when they release something onto Steam. If it's just like a learning experience, and you know, like they just threw something together, and it's it is what it is, and it's their first time, and they didn't really know what they were doing, but they managed to put together a game, and then they finished it and released it to the world. I want to uh, bring up something here. A lot of people know id Software, and they they created Doom and Wolfenstein 3D and a number of other games, um, but. John Romero is just one developer I always like to go back to because he's, he's one of my favorites. But if you look at his list of games that he created, let's see, how far do we have to scroll to get to Doom? Let's make this a little bigger so you can see it. So he created all these games. And these games were not like big budget games that made a ton of money. You know, he was creating a lot of these on his own. Uh, they were like little monthly games and stuff, but he was creating them. They were finished games that you could play. And they went out onto these discs that were like monthly distributed uh, uh, through the mail or distributed monthly through the mail. So you see a lot of those, but there's just, you know, some other discs that went to different places. And, and then we keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling, keep on scrolling. Oh, Wolfenstein and we Commander Keen. Okay, now, you know, after like the 30th or 40th game, we were getting some stuff here that people have played and know and love. Uh, but, I mean, has anyone ever heard of, uh, some people have heard of Catacomb. Has anybody ever heard of Magic Boxes? Has anyone ever played uh, Jumpster? Anybody ever played that? I mean, Space Rogue? I wonder how this one's rated. Look, look at that box art. Okay, that's, that's, some, that's some box art right there. This guy, this tough leather jacket. <laughs> look at him. Twilight. What is this? Twilight Treasure. Okay, here's the box art. It's this truck. <laughs> so anyway, all the way down here, we finally have... Doom. So he created all this and everything that he learned there, most importantly, the tools that he learned to create to allow him to make games even faster, went into Doom, a game that completely changed the industry. But let's say he worked for a while and then he realized that a lot of games were coming out. Let's, just like, let's, uh, let's fast forward this to modern times. He's making a, a bunch of small games that take a, you know hour or so to complete, maybe less than that, just like you know silly little games and stuff, like he, testing new technologies, trying to learn new things himself. And he, he releases Neptune's Nasties and you know gets paid uh, 80 bucks or whatever. That's it. He gets paid 80 bucks. That's all he made from it. And then he reads this. And he comes up here and he looks and he's like, wow, I've got to compete with 11,773 games every single year. And nobody's filling in the potholes. So I guess I better go get a real job and suppress myself and suppress all my needs and wants. Imagine if that happened. Maybe Doom would have come out because there would have been other people working on it. You know, but it would not have had the same flavor without John Romero's input. It wouldn't have had the same iconic imagery. Um, you know, let's say, let's say the same thing for some of the other developers that were in id Software. What if none of them kept making games? You know, Tom Hall made a gazillion games just like John Romero before this. Um, and, I, you know, there were a lot of them working at Atari. Um, and what if they just didn't? What if they just didn't? What if they were like, you know what? We got to go get real jobs. Is that really the way it is? Let me, let me keep talking to the artists here for a minute. 
Do not expect anyone to understand what it is that you're doing. Do not expect anyone to sympathize or empathize with the things that you want to do. That thing that keeps you up at night, those ideas that you have in your head, that's not bad. I mean, like, it's almost, if you read the post, he, he mentions it in here, like that feeling where you need to create and stuff like that. He, he says, like, don't let me stop you, but at the same time, talking about how it's destroying society. So is it destroying society or should people, you know, like he keeps mentioning you shouldn't make games, but don't let me stop you if you really need to. So it's like either go all the way and tell people to fully stop making games or, you know, leave people alone and say it's it's cool. You can keep making artwork. So, yeah, um, that feeling you have, don't expect anyone to sympathize with that. Not even people in the games industry. Nobody is going to understand your ideas or your artwork until you release it. And that's something that I battle with constantly. And the reason that I'm really making this video is because reading that made me angry and made me start doing research. And then I got motivated again because I also start to feel the weight of just everything. You know, like I start to feel like my the things I want to do don't matter. I felt like that when I was working uh, hardcore every day in tech syndicate. You know, that, that became a job, even though it was an interesting job that I created myself and a hell of a lot better than working nine to five. Most of the time I was, I put in way more hours than I ever did when I worked nine to five and stuff like that. But you know, it, that was still aside from what I wanted to do. It was, it was safe that I was like, you know what? I can just continue making this. I got lucky uh, and making YouTube videos. I can continue making these YouTube videos and that's a safe way to make money. But I was absolutely not happy as you can see from, you know, Tech Syndicate Split and then me going and doing my own thing and trying to do gaming and that sort of thing. But at the same time, without all of that mess and failure, I would have done something very dumb. And this is what I hope a lot of artists and wannabe game devs can take away from this, myself included. I'm learning here and sharing as I learn with you. These numbers of games and the quality of games that you see here that are not, you know, like super deep... Uh, not always. Uh, they're not like a lot of them are very simple concepts with simple graphics. A lot of graphics that you know people their store packages and stuff like that you get on the Unity store or the Unreal Asset store and stuff like that. No problem. Um, but these games did require a lot of work. But what I'm saying is not all of them are like someone's magnum opus. And your first game does not have to be the end all magnum opus. It does not have to encompass everything you want in a game. In fact, it should not. These 11,000 games that come out every year, those are learning experiences. And I need to learn from that because when I first started, I was like, you know what, let's make this ridiculously crazy side scroller that's like a medieval version of Metroid, but like bigger and with tons and tons of dialogue that all write up and all these different cool characters and stuff. And I didn't think about like how much time it was gonna take to just design the clothing and the clothing system for the characters in the game. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about how much time it would take to design the weapons. I didn't think about how much time it would take to, uh, you know, figure out the collision for the weapons, the animations and stuff like that, because a game with combat does not feel right if the animations are not on, if they're not, if they're slightly off, you'll lose that visceral feeling and combat will feel floaty or weird or generic or, you know, like it's, it won't feel right. So I didn't think about that. I didn't think about uh, how much goes into the dynamics of the world and how they should change you know, as different dialogue happens and different, you know, quests and plots change, how will that change the rest of the world? I didn't think about any of that and the scope was my brain was too big. I wanted to make this crazy thing. And then it was like, oh, oh, so there's like a realization there. And I feel like if I had like looked at stuff like this earlier and started to put two and two together and realized that not everything is a magnum opus. You know, I wasn't even, I wasn't crawling around itch.io and looking at things. I wasn't like looking at all the new games that were coming out on Steam. I was looking at a lot of the big games that were coming out and a lot of the very successful indie titles that are like the sixth or seventh title from some of these indie developers who also get together with a bunch of other indie developers. Maybe they've been modders for 10, 15 years and they decide to get together and release something and they, it comes out and it's like spectacular. Like, oh my God, how did this indie developer do this? Well, they most of the time, started small. You hear about Stardew Valley all the time because that's a game that someone who was a programmer but decided to put together his own game and really stressed himself out for four or five years and then made his first game and it was beautiful and everyone was like oh my god. You hear about that all 
the time. But that is not indicative of reality. That's like when you hear about someone who wins the lottery and you think, man, I got to go play the lottery because they always report the big winnings, but they don't report on the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of other people who did not have a big win. The people who bought a lottery ticket and it was nothing. And they ended up not, you know, not making any money back from that. What about the people who started making indie games and didn't, just didn't. It didn't work out. They tried and tried and tried and they didn't. You don't hear about that. And what about the people who made an indie game and it didn't do very well? You don't hear about that either. You hear about the big successes. So I think a lot of people think, you know, I could just do this. I can get together and make this giant magnum opus. It's going to be brilliant and then I'll release it into the world and it'll get outstanding reviews and it'll hit the zeitgeist and it'll be it'll be a paradigm shift and all these other big concepts, but that's not the way it's going to be. And this is the realization that I think uh, I needed right now because I've been kind of down lately. I've been kind of like, oh, there's just too much stuff, you know, like, oh, it's, it's, it's daunting. How will I ever do it? I, you know, there's so much pressure because people know who I am and I have to make something. If I'm going to make a game, it's got to be like this. It's got to be good or else, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be I'll be ruined and all that kind of stuff. But that's not how it is. It would be OK if I or if you do a little bit of learning and release something that is just garbage. Who cares? It's fun. You've learned something and you've contributed to this number that not everyone's going to play. That's totally fine. That number doesn't really mean anything other than the fact that a lot of us are creating culture, are doing what we love. And how cool is that for society to have this many people? And it was also down here, there talks about like um, how many songs and stuff come out. 6,000 songs a day released on Spotify. Uh, it's 60,000, I'm sorry, new songs a day. That's it's a ridiculous, I think 78,000 albums or something like that. Uh, millions of books, of course, I think 2.4 million books were published in America. Uh, all these TV shows, wow, that's a lot of TV shows, that are in production, 550. There's a lot of stuff there, and then there's movies, a few hundred movies every year. A lot of media is being made. So how do we find the stuff that's good for us? That's the other problem, is now we have the, the people who make this stuff have a discoverability problem, but the people who are consuming the content, there's that feel of, uh, of worry that you're going to miss out on something. You know, like, what, am, what if I miss a really good game? And that makes me happy as well. If, we, if more of us had this fear, then more of us would do research and stop playing the bullshit AAA games that are mostly designed to pull the maximum amount of money out of the audience while providing them with just enough entertainment so that they don't leave. But also they do studies and studies to find the right mix so that the game is addicting. That's more important than fun. You know, making sure that it's addicting and making sure that they have a marketplace that can, that can continue to reach into your pocket. So with AAA games nowadays, uh, we have, I think uh, that, that's where I see the biggest uh, daunting issue. We need to figure out a way to get people to stop playing games that are no good, that are AAA, you know, just like games designed by a committee that are watered down and really don't have much of a soul, in my opinion. I'm okay gatekeeping the fact that I don't feel like live services that, that companies like EA and Activision make, I don't feel like those uh, should be classified in the same category as a, as a game. You know, a lot of developers worked on it, but it is, in my opinion, a different thing altogether. And I think, I think, I don't want to tell people how to have fun, but I'm, I'm going to say that I believe that a lot of people who are spending tons of their time playing those AAA games, if they played something that was more niche and was more designed, not for a general audience, but just for them, just for the things that they like, that they may find something that they really enjoy. They may find a cozy spot for them. So I don't exactly know the best way to uh, maybe like get people who are into one type of game, the big AAA game, get them to look at some indie games. And if we had a way to do that, that would be really cool. I'm not, if anyone knows in the comments of like a website where it's like, hey, if you like Call of Duty, you should try these five indie games. Or if you uh, really like, I don't know, this big budget game like Destiny or something, I don't know if there's anything like that. Those are, those are microtransaction games. I don't know, they have decent gunplay, I guess. I, I, I don't know. So I feel like that's gonna be the biggest issue is discoverability for the games that are ready for prime time. And when I say ready for prime time, I mean like this is the fourth or fifth game from a developer. 
They've worked on it with a few other uh, experienced developers, and now they've made something that is really good and pure in the raw sense of pure. Like they made something that's exactly what they wanted to make. Nobody uh, with a ton of money told them what to do. They said, you know, if anyone did give them money, they said, make your game. You know, maybe tweak a couple things for fun, but we're not going to tweak anything to exploit the audience at all. So I feel like if people moved away from games with exploitative marketing and exploitative monetary plans and schemes, then the industry would be very healthy. There are a lot of people out there playing games. I mean, we're talking this is a bigger industry than sports. It's a bigger industry than the motion picture industry. So there is a lot of room. There's room for 11,000 games if we could get people to stop playing the stupid games, especially when the, you know, the new games that come like integrated with NFTs and stuff. If we could like just generally push people away from that, then the indie gaming space would be even healthier than it already is. Now, do I think that this is some kind of an apocalypse or whatever, like people seem to think it is? Of course, I just said it was good. Um, but I do think that this can be used to discourage some people, and I hope it does discourage some people. And if you know someone who's making a game or who has a game idea, and their motivations for doing so are monetary gain, like they want to make uh, you know, an app that's going to have tons and tons of microtransactions and skin unlocks, and it's going to be... Uh, if, they're, if they're making a, what I would consider a predatory game, then show them this article. Because they're more likely to look at something like this and, and be like, oh no, it's going to be daunting. We want to discourage that type of person, in my opinion. And I, yes, I am gatekeeping. It's, gaming is something I love. I don't want these marketing types to think that they're going to get you know get do some kind of get rich scheme or make some kind of shitty nft game uh or, or just make some nonsense game that's designed to hook you and force you to spend money you know i, I want to discourage all of that and i want to encourage small teams of people who have a passionate idea that they all are working on that's quirky and zany and doesn't have a lot of info, input from idiots in suits. I want those games. Those are unique. Those are what started the gaming industry in the first place. A lot of them were garbage. A lot of the original Nintendo games were also just awful. <laughs> you play them and they're awful. I mean, to be fair, I think some of the worst ones are the ones that were like movie tie-ins and stuff that had a lot of corporate money behind it. But you know, a lot of them, even the ones that were designed by a few people that were like a, a zany idea, a lot of those are awful too, but there's some gems in there that created franchises that are still around today. So, yes, it's very encouraging to see this much culture just happening. And it's really encouraging to know that there's this many people working in the indie games uh, industry. Remember, let's say maybe one out of ten of those this is my guess. One out of ten of those is going to be something that's amazing. And maybe one in a thousand is a game that's really something that you'll love. Because all of us are different. You know, we're all going to like different games, and that's okay. Like, I actually think it's good that there are some games that some people love and some people hate. Like, Gone Home. Some people love it. Some people hate it. That's cool. It's designed for the people who love it, and obviously not for the people who hate it. That's, that's great. We don't need games designed for everyone. They're watered down and the experience is different so yeah jeff if you want to talk about this i will talk to you about this we can go through we i'll even get into some of the economic stuff with you because i am on the other end of the spectrum when it comes to uh my my thoughts on a lot of this stuff and i my, my bottom line here is if you want to fix a lot of the issues that you mention here they can totally be fixed and they're not going to be fixed by a few artists stopping with their culture creation because culture is so important god how do you not understand how important culture is it's what creates the society that we live in as much as anyone demonizes it and yells and screams about it at the end of the day the people who create the culture the culture is praised whether the creator is praised or not but if you want to fix all of the issues you mentioned here in this long blog post it's really simple in my opinion first off if you want people to do work you have to pay them a living wage. If you want to fix inequality, you have to tax the rich and make them pay people. Like, we don't do that, you know? And if you want to talk about inflation, yes, it exists 
it exists here pretty bad. I mean, the real inflation numbers are not even what they tell you. They're higher than that. But what they don't tell you is almost always inflation and inequality seem to be tied together. That's because a lot of times when they print the money, they give it to the wealthy, they pump it into stocks and stuff like that. And the, and the poorest do not see any of that. And then the rich have an easy way to blame the government and say like, oh, you know what? Uh, there's more money in circulation, so we're going to have to raise prices, but we're not going to pay you anymore. You know, if the government printed a bunch of money and the rich raised a bunch of prices and then the rich get exponentially richer and have record profits and make billions every single day, like if you look at the billionaires and how much richer they got during COVID while the money printers were on, and then look at the poor and see how they got poorer and then see record profits everywhere, you should sit back and be like, well, why are they not paying people who do the work? Why are they not paying them? It doesn't make any sense. If you look at some countries in Europe, well, yes, they did print a lot of money, but they paid people slightly more than the inflation rate, so their buying power actually went up. I mean, there's a ton of other things we can get into, but that's just the basics, the easiest thing we could do to get all of those stupid potholes filled. Just just pay people. And then a lot of people who are going to fill potholes, guess what? They're going to go home because they don't work more than like eight or 10 hours a day, and they have a little bit of time to themselves. Let them create. Let them leave them alone. Let them make art. Let them have an outlet to be a human. This is so basic. God, this article is so bad. Jeff, why? Why? Oh, um, yeah. All right, that's the end of this. Society's falling apart and you really want to police what however many people it takes to make 11,000 games a year. You want to police what they do with their time. I mean, what if I made a video and we're like, why don't all of you who sit at home and watch Fox News stop wasting your time watching TV and go out and fill potholes? How about, you know, any, what are, what's another pastime? People who play video games. Like, art is not always a day job. And a lot of the indie games, I guarantee you, it's not a day job until they've made it, um, made enough money on that that they can make it a day job. And then it becomes that. So I don't think that that's even a feasible problem, especially when you consider how many millions of people there are in the entire world, it's billions, but how many millions there are in America who could be out there doing stuff. Why don't you yell and scream at them for not filling the potholes? Or better yet, why don't you yell and scream at the local government for not paying enough to, for them to fill the potholes? You're so worried about how they use their time, but people need something to do. So how dare you tell them or try to discourage them from creating art? If you're an artist, keep making content. I'm sorry if you're misunderstood or I'm sorry if it's difficult sometimes, but there are people out there who do want you to succeed. And though I can't play every game on the market, sometimes I'll scroll by and see a really interesting game and, and you know, like see some cool screenshots and maybe a little bit of an interaction. And even if I don't have time to play that game or I'm not gonna play it myself, I do feel really happy just seeing that, hey, someone made something and it's out there. It must feel really, you know, like a good accomplishment. But even then, if you're not making games for anybody, if you're just alone in a room making something and that's how you want to spend your time, that is valid and you're doing something awesome and who knows what it could turn into. It could just be something you do for fun or maybe it'll turn into something huge. But don't stop. Keep making art. And that's what I want to leave this with. Don't let anyone discourage you. Don't let anyone tell you how to spend your time we already trade enough of it for money so that we can live. And I know a lot of people here, obviously, are watching this on a phone or on a computer, so you have some stuff. You know, times are tough, but you have to have an outlet for your mental health. You have to have an outlet if you're creative, just because that's it's something in you. And if you don't get it out, trust me, I've tried to suppress things. I've tried to work normal jobs. I've had nine to fives. I've had office jobs. I was miserable, even though sometimes I had a little more money it's not worth it. I don't want to be on my deathbed, you know, regretting the fact that I didn't follow the creative urges I had. So, and hopefully you'll take this as uh, inspiration. Let me know what you think in the comments.